this is a kind of a different setting for uh, me and Tawana. And so uh, this is this is probably although we have been in ministry for a long time together, whether it was preaching, teaching or even counseling. Uh, this is the first time we were able to do this side by side. And so uh, uh, so I really don't know what you're going to get today. I know what we're going to say, but we pray that the Lord will do whatever needs to be done in your mind and in your heart this morning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be probably, no, not probably, we're going to be transparent. We're going to be transparent about who we are because in marriage there is real situations. There's real problems. Problems with your kids, problems with finances, problems with everything that you didn't think of when you first said, I do. And, the, and now when you think about those problems, they make you want to say, I don't. But, but the, the, the thing of it is, is that we know that God is able because God has intervened so many times in my marriage that we can't even, we can't even count. And so for you who may have been gone through a divorce or like Herb said, if you're single looking to be married, one thing we want you to do is just look at this with an open mind because still, like Herb said, this is for you. This is for everybody. And so if, if it, do, if it doesn't fit you, you know what? Maybe God is establishing a resume for a new husband. Maybe he's establishing a resume for a new wife. Amen. Because no one wants to repeat the same things over. And so we thank you that uh, God, like I said, he has intervened in our marriage. And so what I wanted to do is, I guess, when I thought about some things that we could talk about, I guess I got to start at the beginning. In, in the book of, uh, uh, in the word of God, it starts off with Genesis. So I'll just tell you about our beginning days. And it started off good, but then we hit a rough patch and it was rough. And then it turned for the good as well. And so anyway, uh, the first day I met Tawana was in 1985, August. Um, she was going in the hallways, her and her cousin, they were registering for school. Me and a friend of mine, we had just came from football practice, and uh, she met this hunk, this starter team, <laughs> and then uh, then she met me. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I had just came from football practice, and uh, Tawana, uh, we just kind of made eye contact. And so I just looked at her, she looked at me, and, and all of you all had this feeling, if you dated just for a moment, you know what you said when you made eye contact. So I said, mm, she's looking at me, and mm, I'm looking at her. So we made a little conversation, they looked, asked for directions, we told them, and then my friend said, ooh, man, that girl was, that girl was bad. And I didn't say nothing on the inside, but I'm saying to myself, I was looking at her. So anyway, we um, so 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 we started school and um, we still played this game of just kind of, as we say, mugging each other in the hallway. We were looking each other up and down. Uh, one day I said hello and she spoke back and we kept on going. And I was a very, very shy individual at the time. So you wouldn't gonna really get too many words out of me. And so we did this probably for like a semester. We just kind of eyeballed each other. And then one day I just felt bad and bold enough to ask her a question. What's your phone number? And so uh, she gave it to me. And then all of a sudden, one day I didn't see her no more. I lost her number and she was gone for about a about a month a month and a half, and I started asking people around, where's that girl at? Where's that girl? Her name is Tawana. Where's, where's she go? Where's she go? So anyway, I thought she left school. I said, man, I missed my opportunity. And so anyway, one day I go in the principal's office. Uh, I'm not going to tell you why, but um, <laughs> I went to the principal's office, and she was there. And I said to myself, where you been? I couldn't hear it. It just leaped out of me. And so she said she had surgery. She had something removed, I think a tumor removed from her chest. And so and then that was kind of the, the, the beginning of of us conversing and courting each other. So and I believe finally in January 1986, I asked her to be uh, to be my girlfriend. And back then we call it going together. I think today they call it courting or whatever. Uh, so it, it started out very, very good. And um, in, in July of 20. Oh my goodness, I'm giving my marriage day wrong. The 22nd of July of 1989, we got married. 
that's when we both said I do. And um, I had joined the, the military and things was kind of innocent at first. Um, and so we were just like all newlyweds. You're happy. You are you do everything. It's just you. It's just you two. There's pretty pretty much no kids in the picture. So every dollar and that's all we had was dollars. And because we didn't have any money back then. So um we just kind of dated. We did what we want. We went to movies and it was really uh just kind of skips, hugs, kisses and uh butterflies at that point. And then uh all of a sudden, you know, I began to notice that uh my eyes began to wander. And I just kind of downplayed it. I kind of minimized it. It really wasn't such a big deal. I just said, okay, well she was she was looking at me. And so and something that I just noticed in the military is that uh I began to get too much attention that I had never received before. And so uh I really didn't know how to take that. And so with me being a, a, a young man, um I just went, well, you know what? I'm married. I can't I can't mess around, I can't do this. So I stayed away from it. And then, but the enemy, he keeps on coming, he keeps bringing that temptation just to try what's in your heart. And really, lust was in my heart. Lust was already there. And so uh, it started with a conversation. I had one conversation, then one conversation led to another conversation, then a conversation led to another. And that's pretty much how uh, lust kind of sort of infiltrated our marriage. And so what we once had was innocent, uh, it wasn't pure and innocent anymore. And recognizing um, the change, I knew something was going on because now he was hanging with a group of guys that was enlisted who they had to have their beer and they had to go to the club and they had to uh, be around each other all the time and I wasn't feeling those guys. I didn't want them around me. I didn't want them in my house. But before then, my first contact with what was going on with the military, I had a neighbor, and I lived in Radcliffe before they got us housing. And she told me, she said, I want you to watch that when Dwayne and my husband comes home from work, a particular young lady who was single will come out of her apartment. I told her, I don't, I don't, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I was like, you're kidding me. And she came out the house when they wrote, when their cars put in the parking lot. And so she was trying to warn me, understanding my innocence, knowing that I was only 18 years old. And um, I had moved away from home and came to Radcliffe. And then we moved on Fort Knox. And that's when the trouble really started. I began to be in so much pain because I didn't understand how a man could say he loved me. And yet, I knew in my knower, I knew in my gut he was cheating on me. I had no proof, but I knew his behavior had changed. Now, his behavior didn't change where he treated me bad. Dwayne has always been loving to me and kind. He's always, um, even by the time we had children, he's always been a great dad. He helped at home. He helped clean up, wash dishes, clean the bathroom. He was always kind to me. But I told him he became Superman in Clark Kent. At home, he was Clark Kent. But when he went to the club, he became Superman. And he put on his cape, and he became somebody else. And um, little did I know, things started manifesting like venereal diseases um, and things like that. And so I began to cry. I began to say, I don't understand this thing. I don't, I don't get it. But being raised in the church, okay, being raised in a holiness church, church of God in Christ, I heard the word all my life. I was there so long. I don't remember my first day of church because that's where we lived. That's, and my mother wasn't even born again. Her mother was. My grandparents were saved. They called, they used to say, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious Holy Ghost. So, um, 
and I heard the word and I fell in love with God. But because of the way that they presented the father, they made him so hard and unreachable. I was afraid, but I loved their testimonies. I loved to be in his presence. And so doing this rough patch that we were going through, I often would look up at the sky sometime and say, God, I'm going to be saved. You know, or God, I love you. But I would go back and, and, and we would go back to the way we were living and uh, things got really rough. And one day, um, and I'm fast forwarding some things, but one day Dwayne was going away again. You know how the military is. They send you on another tour, another school. And I knew every time we were separated, he was messing around. And so, um, and he was messing around while we were in the same house together, but I knew it really happened when we were uh, separated and he was going to school. And he looked at me and he said, if things don't change when I get back, then we gotta do something else. And I was devastated, I was mad. I went back and I said, God, I didn't bring this mess in our marriage. I'm not a cheater, I didn't do these things. And he's going to give me an ultimatum. Like, I knew he was saying that if I didn't stop the nagging, if I didn't quit um, asking him and checking. I mean, I was so bad. I would check the mileage on the car. I knew how many miles went from my house to the commissary because I did not trust him. He had broke something that was deep. And so um, I got angry, and, and I was angry because... Here it is, he doesn't have to report to Sunday evening at 6, but he was leaving Friday morning. So I was really upset because now I'm saying, now you're going to check it out, see what's going on. You know, you could spend that extra day and a half here with us. And by this time, we had a daughter, Diera was born, and she was two years old. And um, I'm broken. For the first year of her life, I don't even really remember. I remember spurts because I was so stressed. I was so out of it. I was in so much pain. I only really remember like her birthday party. And I remember that day that he said what he said to me. And before uh, I kind of want to move on from that, um, it's something else how I caused the marriage, the problems into the marriage, but yet the enemy had me bold enough to say, if some things don't change, we gotta, I'm gonna do something different. And basically I was letting her know, putting her on watch that when I got back two half, two and a half months from now, I, I wanted to change or we was divorcing. I just didn't use the D word. And so, uh, but when you're overtaken by lust, it will cause you to do things and, and, and sin takes you further than you want to go. It never just affects the person that's in sin. It in infected my entire household because of what I allowed to come in. But that was my thought process is before I leave out of here, woman, I'm not taking it no more. When I come back from school, I left in August, I'm coming back in October, some things better better be different. And um, and it and it actually was, but it wasn't on my part. She gave her uh she gave her life to the Lord uh when when I when I was in school. And and still I'm still thinking, okay, now she's going to try to change me. That's the first thing I'm thinking in my mind. I'm still going to be who I am. I'm still going to go to the club. I'm still going to uh, drink my 40 ounces. I'm still going to do this. So, But that's good. You got saved. And so that was my, my, my arrogant answer to her receiving salvation. And so uh, the Army put me on assignment to go to Korea. And I never will forget it. Uh, I tried, like, I don't know what to get out of this assignment. And so I did not want to go to Korea. 
And I'm like, man, this is messed up because for real, she did change. And it was it was really working on me because I realized she was praying for me and she had some people at church praying for me. For some reason, I went to the club, but it didn't seem fun no more. I did things, but I really kind of wanted to get out of them. And back then, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that my household had changed. And I'm saying to myself, why should I leave now? God, this 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 place is changing. She changed, but I still didn't. And so I said to myself, God was like, you cannot, I don't, I don't care how many people you know in the army. I don't care how many people that normally push buttons. I went to the, to the sergeant major. I went to a civilian. I'm like, yeah, they're going to give me out this assignment. And then finally, my, my, my supervisor, he was a GS 12, set me down. He said, Dwayne. I said, yeah, Jack. He said, uh, I heard you don't have your orders. I said, I thought she was working on giving me out this assignment. He says, well, I tried. I can't. For some reason, I've gotten 10 or 12 soldiers out of their assignment to Korea, to other places. But for some reason, I can't get you out of this assignment. But I can get you where you want to go when you get back. I'm like, that ain't the answer I want. I don't want to go. And so I sat there in amazement. I was supposed to report in 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 three weeks. I had did nothing. And so I had to get on the stick. And so finally, I went to Korea. Um Within 10 days, I met someone, um, really actually the, the, the third day, and it was just a bad relationship. I never will forget uh, that we were sitting at this end processing station. We were getting orientated. This girl walked past. I looked at her. She looked at me. And then I looked, she kept, I looked to look back. She was still looking at me. I looked away. She was still looking at me. And I said, well, I'm going to get up. And this guy who I did not know from Adam, he grabs my arm like this. And I looked down at him getting up. I sat back down. I said, man, what's wrong with you? He said, man, I don't want you to get in trouble. And I snatched my arm away from him. I said, man, I ain't going to get in trouble. And so at that moment, I believe that God had him to speak to me one last time to get me to do some kind of right. But I, just like many of us, I just ignored the warning signs. I thought that, you know what, uh, maybe I am invincible. Maybe this ain't going to happen to me. And so I, I pursued her and, and didn't, I barely knew her name. We had sex for out of the 10 days, maybe seven eight of them and then that was she was gone somewhere I, I left and went somewhere and so that was pretty much it and I began to pick up where I left off in the states so I started started going to clubs and in Korea people drink over there every day and and so there's no differential uh, difference between the weekend or a weekday every day is the same in Korea and then um, finally uh, I got the urge one day to want to go to church. I just want to intervene for one minute because I want to take you back. When he came back from school, I remembered a couple that had befriended us and they uh, were Christians and they invited us to church. So that Friday when he left that morning, I got on the phone and I called them and I said, look, I'm going to church with you on Sunday. That particular Sunday, they told me they would come pick me and my daughter up. They never showed up. I jumped in the car, went to their house. They were in the bed. And I came in and I sat on the couch. I said, I'll wait till you get dressed. Because I was, I was in so much pain. I was desperate. I understood that I needed something greater in my heart, and because I had heard about this, this God, I understood he, he, he could fix it. I knew he could. I just felt like I just needed to get there. And I, they finally got dressed. We all left, and we went to a church in Radcliffe, and I gave my heart to the Lord. And when I walked outside, you know that saying? They say, I looked at my hands. They looked new. I looked at my feet, and they did too. I really felt that. That was a, a weight lifted. And then the pastor's wife came to me, and she knew that my husband was not saved. She came over the next morning, which was Monday morning, brought me my first Bible. I had my own Bible. And she said, I'm going to pray with you. So over a course of time, she ended up coming to my house before he came back from school. And she said, we're going to pray. 
She even went to my bedroom and said, what side of the bed does he sleep on? <laughs> and she began to anoint that side with oil. And she began to say, Father, let him feel peace that he's never felt before. Let this house be a house that's changed. No more chaos, God. And she just began to speak those things that be not as though they were. And I didn't re realize it, but I felt the presence of God. So he finally came home from school. And he, um, well, before then, I called him and I told him I was saved. He was like, okay, that's good for you. He said, that's great. And I hung up and I was sad because I, he didn't feel happy for me. But like he said in his thought, he was thinking she just come to change me. And so he came home and he wouldn't stop any further. He stopped in the foyer and I said, what's wrong? He said, this house is so still, it's almost scary. He don't know on the inside I was jumping for joy. On the inside I was praising God so because I understood that his presence is tangible. It really is. And so he felt something. Even being a sinner, he knew this is something's going on here. And then... As I began to read my word and I knew he had to leave and go to Korea, I began to love on him in spite of how I feel. I was still angry. I was still hurting. And I remember going in the bathroom, gripping the toilet, putting my face in the commode so he wouldn't hear me cry and scream because I was in torment. One day I would read the word and the word would help me. And it would say, forgive and the love. And, and the next day I would be angry because I'm saying, why does he keep doing this to me? And so all I knew was, God, your word said that the unbelieving is sanctified by the believer. And I began to continue to say, God, I'm going to love him. I'm going to love him to you. I'm going to love him. You know, I'm going to love him till he wants you, God. You know, and, and, and I remember one joyous day we had. It was fall and we were raking the leaves in, off of our grass and quarters. And he threw the leaves up and De'Ara did to my baby. She was two. And we all just fell in the leaves and we laughed and played and we hadn't done that in years. And so I began to know. And but I was saddened again because he had to leave again. He had to go. And so um he departed from us. But then as he departed and he went to Korea, I began to have dreams and God began to reveal things. And one dream that I had was that this lady had walked down these steps to me and handed me this baby in a blue blanket. And his mother was with me. And she spoke to me and said, I don't want to ruin anybody's life. I just want my son to know his father. And so I told Duane, I, I got in touch with him. I said, look, if you don't stop what you're doing, it's going to be a baby come out of this. And I said, I don't know. I love you, but I don't know. But if you don't quit, I said, I seen it. And I had other dreams that I called him about. And I would tell him what color clothes he had on. I told him what song would be playing in the club. And he, he was like, oh, I haven't been to the club. I didn't go out. I didn't do that. But later on, he told me, he said, I was so afraid. I thought somebody was over here watching me and going back and tell you. <laughs> but the Holy Ghost is real. And I told him I could smell the smoke in the club. I could smell the cigarettes. I could smell the alcohol. I told him what music was playing. And so I went to church, and the Spirit of God was moving, and I was ushering at the back door. And they asked me if, if anybody had a testimony, and I said, yes, I'm stepping out on faith that before my husband comes home, from Korea before that tour is over, he would be saved. And the church erupted because they understood the women did my pain. Women, I just want to tell you that it is important that you have solid women around you when you're going through. Those women didn't give me what I wanted. They gave me the scripture. They gave me the word of God. And they didn't plaster my business all over Fort Knox either. They were godly women that held my neck in this secure. 
because I was a young mother. I had a two-year-old daughter. I had a husband who was sleeping around, and yet when they met him, they loved him, and yet they prayed with me. They got on their knees and they prayed with me. The spirit of prophecy was big in the church we were in, and, and a lot of ladies in that church would have dreams as well. And they would tell me, and we would pray. I believed the word. I just did. I didn't know nothing else. And so as time went on, and Dwayne and his young lady had sex, and they departed, God began to do something in his heart. And and when... um. She went to another part of Korea. I stayed where I was. Um, I guess you can say I kind of took a break from Hoenn. Um I, I didn't mess with no one. Um, I just kind of went to the club, stayed to myself, drank beer. And uh, then I, I met a friend from Fort Knox. Uh, he was over there. We started going to the club and everything just picked back up. But at the same time, I did not feel right. I, I developed a what's then, I thought it was the conscience. I could not go into those places. And although I was there, I was just there. Nothing about me wanted to be there. I just did what I was used to doing because that's all I did. But I began to go to church one day. And um, we went to a service. It was kind of like a, a Baptist service in Korea. Uh, they have different, they call it a gospel service. And so uh, they all use the same building, but different services go in and out uh, the, the church. And so I went to the gospel service. And one day the, the chaplain asked the question. He said, who all in here is saved? Well, I knew not to, if anything, when I knew I was, when I was in the world, don't play with God. So I was not going to raise my hand. I had a praying great grandmother and I know what a godly woman and a godly man is supposed to look like from my grandmother, my great grandmother, my great grandfather. And he said, who all in here is saved? And it's a lot of hands went up and it's like God suspended it, the atmosphere just for that moment so I can glance throughout the service and see who raised their hand. And I was shocked. I was shocked at the hands that went up because some of those people, some of those women I had been with. And I'm saying to myself, huh, huh. And then there was a guy who went up. He, spang, he sang, a, uh, as they called, a, a selection. He got up and sang a, a selection. And I remember him. He was just hung over with me the night before. And I just started scratching my, her, my head. I'm saying, I can't come back to this service. When I walked out, a friend of mine, I, I couldn't wait till he gave the benediction. I got out of the church. And my friend named Troy, he said, man, wait a minute. What you, where you going? Where you going so fast? I said, man, look, I can't go to that church. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I still want to go to church, but I can't go to that church. All those hands that went up, he said, yeah, man, those, those half of those was your brothers because at the time I was a mason. And I did not, I could not believe. It just, it just put things in perspective to me. And so I went to another service that evening, and it was a Church of God in Christ service. And it was only about 15, 20 people in that service. And I thought, man, this is kind of light. Ain't nobody really in here, but this kind of light service. Maybe people go on to the field. But when the word of God is truly being preached, yes, you're not going to have a lot of people in that service. Because some people just don't want to be told about their sin. They don't like how that sin makes them feel when they're getting the truth. But I knew that's where I needed to be. So I just kept going to that service, kept going to that service. And then one day, right about two weeks before I went uh, on mid tour back to Fort Knox, um, I gave my heart to the Lord. It's something, an overwhelming conviction came over me. I started crying and I couldn't wait till he gave the invitation. I was shaking 
And I've said to myself, because normally I wanted to go Sundays before, but I kept saying, I'm not going to be the only one up there. It's just going to be me. I don't want everybody looking at me. That Sunday, it didn't matter. I kept on crying. I went up there. He led me through the sinner's prayer. And then when I walked away, it, I felt something. I felt that everything was different. Like she said, she looked at her hands. Her hands looked new. And, and all of that came over me. And I was so excited. I did not want to live the same way that I did yes, before I went to the altar. And so my friend Troy, he, he, me and him was, was, as they say, thicker than thieves. I made an impact on him. He got saved two Sundays later. He did not join masonry. And so it was just he and I over there. And you know what? He said, man, I said, you what? I've got to go to keep going to this service because this service is keeping me. Yes. It's feeding me. A lot of things I did not understand at the time that God was doing because I looked in the mirror one day and I thought about what kind of man I was. I didn't like me. I didn't like the father I had become. I didn't, I did not want my daughter to marry a man like me and I broke. I, 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 I broke because I said to myself, I was a reflection of, I can remember every time I, I, I cheated on her or every time I made her upset or every time I, 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 I caused pain to her, I moved her from St. Louis and, 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 and here I am taking advantage of my, of my wife and everything just started bombarding my mind and I'm thinking to myself, what type of man am I? I didn't like me anymore. Until you get to that point mm, Jesus. in your walk where you don't think you're as good as you thought you were, yes, Lord. that's when God can do the most work in your life. Yeah. My heart was fertile. My mind was open. And everything I did, it was about God. But then one day, about three months later, I get a phone call. I'm still in Korea. And there was the girl on the phone who I had met when I first got there that when the guy tried to stop me from going to talk to her, she said, I need to talk to you. So I said, uh, what's she talking to me for? Unless she want to go to church, she's going to get the Lord. So then when I met with her, she said, look, I don't mean to tell you this, but I got to tell you, I'm getting ready to leave Korea because I'm pregnant. My mouth dropped. And I said, really? And she said, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if you're the father or it's two more people. She said, I don't know. And so then I kept my cool. I kept it together. But when I got back to my room, I cried like a baby. I said, my God. And then I could hear the words of my wife, you know, the dreams that she had and, and the, the things that she said to me. Dwayne, you're going to have a baby on me if you don't stop. And it just, I just cried even more. But one thing about me was this, is that, um, I got to be honest. I just read in the word that the truth will make you free in John. And, and so I called her one day. Uh, it took me about two days to make this phone call. I called her and I said, baby, I need to talk to you. And I started crying. I said, look, I am so sorry. This girl who over here who I was messing with, I ain't seen her in months. She tells me that she might, she's pregnant and she don't know if I'm the father. And so she just, she loses it. She starts going crazy. Uh, and I'm just steady on the phone crying. And I, I just hung up the phone. I'm still crying. And so I get a phone call back. It was my mother-in-law. I'm like, oh, my God. Now, when he calls me. I see the dream vivid. So I'm hysterical because I'm saying, God, he's saved now. Isn't we supposed to rejoice? Isn't this, isn't this the, the time where we are supposed to say we have the victory? But he calls me and tells me there's a possibility that this woman is pregnant. I already knew the baby was his. But he didn't know that my mother was there visiting. And I'm downstairs. She's upstairs with my baby. And 
I am going crazy. And I hang up and I run upstairs and I go, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm packing my bags because when you leave, I'm leaving. She said, what is going on? I said, Dwayne just calls me and tells me this girl that he met when he first got to Korea has contacted him and they talked and she doesn't know if this baby's his, but it is his. And I'm saying, mom, it's his. I've already seen it, got and already showed it, and I'm done. First, she says, call him back. I need to speak to him. In my mind, I'm going, yes, for the first time, she's going to let him have it. <laughs> now she's going to cuss him out. You know what I'm saying? But I want him to be cussed out. You know what I'm saying? Cuss him good because, you know, I'm, I'm a wreck and I'm hurting. And I'm like, somebody needs to beat him because he didn't listen to me. So she calls him back. And the first word that comes out of her mouth is son. I'm mad. I'm like, if you wasn't my mama, I'd hit you. <laughs> because you're not supposed to be kind to him right now. You're supposed to be mean. And she says, son, I know it seems bad right now, but it's not as bad as, you, as, as it seems. And I'm, I cry more because I'm saying, when am I going to have vengeance? When is somebody going to look at what is done to me? And so, little did I know, but Dwayne says on the other end, he was in a fetal position in his bed, just weeping because he was thinking the same thing. My mother-in-law's always loved me, but now she's getting ready, she's getting ready to cuss me to one end and to the other. And he said it broke him further because he expected her to be at him when she was gentle. So she gets ready to leave after her stay there. And I'm walking her to the door and I'm practically begging. I'm saying, Mama, please, I, 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 I'm going with you. She said, no, baby. She said, Dwayne loves you. He really does. She said, no, you stay. I thought that was the craziest thing. She leaves and I'm, I'm looking up to the sky and I'm telling God, everybody's nuts. You know, <laughs> you, he does this and she tells me to stay. But women of God, let me tell you something. She knew something that I didn't know. She knew that God had a purpose and a plan. She knew it was the beginning of something, but all she knew was it was the will of God for me to be with him. I'm telling you, if my mama would have just gave me a slight wink that she wanted me to come, I would have been with her. I'm telling you, I would have. But I stayed because mama, you can't come with me. You got to stay. Now, during this process, I go to um, the women in my church and, and we're praying and stuff. Me and him is talking on the phone, and I'm saying, I really don't want this marriage anymore. And um, he said, well, we're going to fast and pray. He said, I'll be home at this time, and we're going to fast and pray, and we're going to believe she's contacting me. She's in the States, and we're going to take a blood test. I said, Dwayne, why are we fasting? I already know the baby's yours. But in the process of time, that's when God began to take me through his word. He began to tell me the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And he began to tell me he did love you and he does love you. But the spirit of lust has taken over his life. And he began to tell me, and you, Miss Goody Two Shoes, you're no better than him just because he committed adultery. He began to tell me you're a liar. He began to tell me that, you know, I had pride. I thought because I didn't cheat on my husband that I was better than he was. And in God's eyes, he loves us the same. But I didn't know that I had inward stuff that you couldn't see, even though his was manifested outwardly because he actually cheated, physically did it. 
He began to take me through his word and show me about inward sins and, and things that go on on the inside of a person and how he wants your heart clean. Then I got mad at God and said, wait a minute. This ain't about me. It's about him. He said, oh, it's been about you the whole time. Then he began to show me how to have grace and love and compassion that if it had not been for him, I could have been doing the same thing. There was many times I was approached by men in the military. I remember even um, I was a, 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 a I worked in the mess hall and I was a server when I started out. And I remember a guy even followed me home and I I ran in the house back then. We didn't have cell phones. I ran in the house, got on the on the on the home phone and I said he's outside I said I told him I was married I don't know why he's following me I mean this was before I even had my daughter so God took me back and showed me if it wasn't for my grace and my mercy if there's none that I've committed into my hand that I've lost it's it's me that kept you not you not because you're so good and it made me look at my husband different but I had something else to battle, y'all. I had to battle having this baby in my life. Okay, God, I forgave Dwayne. All right. I know I ain't that good. Okay. I understand that I'm a sinner. But how do I deal with this boy that I did not sign up for? How do I deal with the fact that I did not bear him and he came from somebody else? I said, now you asking a lot. And he took me to his word again. And he began to say, my grace is sufficient. I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to hear, don't have nothing to do with him. Don't be around him. He will never be around my daughter. I just wanted it over. I was like, mm -mm, I'm not going to be my mama. Because my father did the same thing. I'm like, I'm not going to be her. And then he softened my heart. We went down and we took the test. I just want to say this real quick. When we walked in that place and I laid eyes on that baby, he looked just like my daughter. He only had on, he just didn't have a headband because he was a boy. I fell in love with that baby. But I was still hurting at the same time. I had this war going on inside of me because I absolutely love children. But the devil said, look at him. He prettier than your kids. <laughs> look at him. He got that pretty hair. That look, you know, and, and you, I'm just being real. Um, I wanted to take him home, but then I wanted to throw him away. And I looked over at Dwayne and I said, I told you we ain't got no business fasting. Fasting for what? You know, he was like, the test ain't came back. You know, we still going to wait on God. <laughs> And through time, now I had to deal with his mama. Oh, you got yours. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess that um, I'm going to go back to when I called her mom, or, or her mom called me back. Um, I was so hurt by the fact that I hurt her that I was willing to I thought the worst when I went home I thought there was going to be no home I thought she was going to take everything she's going to take everything out the account at this point I'm like I deserve it because I was that real with myself and what I did and when a mother got on the phone and said what she said and I realized she was there I'm like Oh, my God, I thought she was at home by yourself. And she got on the phone, and she told me she was there. I just started crying more, and I cried even more because my mind could not understand the love mm. that she was showing me after what I did to her daughter. 
I cried even more. But that's God's love. Yes, Lord. We can't sin so bad that whatever we did, God can't pull us out of that sin. Amen. So I don't care whatever you've done, whoever you did it with, whatever you're doing is not bad enough where God can't reach you. That was the big thing that I got. And then from that day forward, I realized it was going to struggle, but I was going to be, I was on a mission of change. I was on a mission of change. I couldn't wait to get back to the States. It was settled in my heart. It was fixed. I was fully persuaded that I was going to be a changed man. But I saw her struggles that she was going through because when we got those test results, and she's right, I did. I went to every brother in that church. We fasted and prayed. We believed God. But but by the time we got done and we got the results, because it took like eight months, my heart was changing. Her heart was changing. And we just didn't talk about it. But I already knew what the outcome was going to be. And it was. It was 99.7%. The child was mine. And we both felt an overwhelming peace when we got those results that I cannot understand, can I, I can't explain. So the first thing I did was write a check. And we sent it to him. But that still started days, months, and years for recovery. That day she struggled. We're both saved now. We're both Holy Ghost filled. But we can't escape what was done in the past because I realized God forgave me, but he didn't forgive the sin. And I still, there was consequences because I, there, I believe there is a, a timeline that we can cross with God. Some of, the, some of it may be five days. It may be five years for some. But it was probably five years for me. And I believe I went over that time frame that grace and mercy had to abound. Because if it says if a man continues in sin, what will happen? So God forbid, make grace abound. God forbid. So I understood what I had did. I understood that I brought this child into our marriage. I understood the struggles and pitfalls that she had of the trust that I had broke. I understood a lot. And throughout those years, God was transforming me that I had to tell her that if you stay in this marriage, because I know you're struggling, if you stay, I'll let you go. I'll give you everything you want. I'll just start over. But if you choose to stay, You'll never regret it another day in your life. Everything I broke, I'll fix. Not knowing the, the, how many days or how many months or how many years it was going to be. That's what I told her. And we went through that. We went through the trials and, and, and it could, I could be going to work and, and she watching Oprah. And next thing I know is it hit a trigger. And she said, Dwayne, what about this girl? And I'm like, where, where'd that come from? What about this girl? And what about that girl? And I started telling her and I told her, I explained, I explained to her everything. So I set her down. I said, you know what? I'm going to start on this story for about five years and I'm going to bring you up to where I got saved. I told her about every woman I had ever been with, how many times we did it, where we did it at, because I had an understanding of what the truth would do. And the more I spoke the truth, the liberated I became, but it bound her up. And let me say this. We're not preaching or teaching or telling you that that's for everybody. Okay? Because you got to be able to handle what you hear and what you know. And when he began to tell me every woman he had done, what he had done with them, where they had done it at, how many times I ran to the church again. I ran to the women of the church, my pastor and um, a deacon's wife. And the deacon wife told me, she said, don't allow his liberty to become your stumbling block. 
I said, well, I need God to help me with what I know. Because you think you want to know, but when you know it, then you got to know how to love anyway. Regardless of what you heard and what they did and how many times. You got to be able to show the love of God because God has forgiven him. Not that you don't feel the pain. But you got to go in some depths of God to say, you got to put that grace power on me because I can't do it in and of my own self. So I'm not saying go out and tell, ask your husband, or you go home and say, this is what I ever did with everybody I ever done it with. I'm telling you, you got to be led by the Holy Ghost because it is real. In doing that process, he told me, he said, if I ever have not told you something, he said, when God bring it back to my remembrance, I'll remind you. And i never forget, we, we was in Louisville. He said, oh, did I tell you about this girl? Her mama lived right down there, down the corner, around the street on, on the third block. Oh, I dated her for about, you know, three months. It was just a booty call. I just asked her, you know, you want a burger or a booty? You want some burger or some booty? You know, you know, because I told her my wife keep a checkbook. She keep the money. And it's all the money I got is $20. I'm sitting in that seat like, will somebody stop this vehicle and let me out so I can run as far as I can? Because you don't understand. I'm telling you, when, 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 when that kind of thing is dropped on you, and you got to live with it and keep loving. Because he's saved. He's loving God. He is praying every day in your house at 430 in the morning. You're here him interceding for you and your children. But then he dropped that on you. If you don't know God, you're going to get to know him because I'm telling you that's not easy. You got to know you saved, show enough save, save. And that you got to know that God' grace is truly sufficient and he must empower you because I'm telling you that wasn't the last time he dropped it on me. I remember going and we was on Fort Knox. He said, oh, yeah, remember I used to work for Protocol. You know, Protocol, we was in charge of all the hotels and all the incoming generals and stuff coming in, you know, and I was in charge, so I used one of those rooms. I can't take. I'm saying, God, I'm not strong enough for this. But I just believe the women that believe what she said, she said, don't allow. She said, don't shut it down. She said, don't shut it down. He's getting free. But I'm like, but I'm being towed up. I'm being broke. He's getting free and I'm, 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 I'm in more pieces. But little did I know, God is so good. Little did I know he was putting me back together again. He was putting me together in a different kind of way. Because when this baby started coming in my life, I looked at him one day when he came and visited and I said, God, make it like I gave birth to him. Put, put the love in me like he came out of me. Because that's the only way I could do it. That's the only way I could do it because I, I knew I would mistreat him or I would, you know, ladies, let's get real. You get mad and, and, and you know, he, you know how kids do. They fight and argue and you, you want to take your kid's side. You know, I didn't want none of that. I didn't want it. I didn't want to resort to that because I knew it was wrong, but I had to ask God to do it like that for me. And then he turns around and rejects me. You're not my mama. I would say I love you. And he would say, mm-hmm. He wouldn't even say he loved me back. I remember going to work to, uh, on Fort Knox and I was driving from E-Town. And I began to cry and I began to say, God, you did it. I feel like he's mine. I mean, even when we're all together, nobody would even think he's not my child. He looks just like all of us. I said, but now he don't want me. He said, don't you know that's how I feel when I'm rejected? He said, that's how I feel. And so now we have this boy in our life and I have a son. Now, and De'Ara and all of them are grown up, and he's living in Louisville, and my daughter's living in Radcliffe, and my other son, he's living in um, 
Elizabeth Tell, and now he calls me mom. He called me one day from school. He said, Mom, I just want to talk to you. I said, sure. He began to tell me about his pain and growing up and knowing how he was conceived and understanding. And I cried with him and I said, Juwan, you know, me and you didn't sign up for this baby. But now you're a blessed man because now you got them that love you and then us over here that love you. But he went through too. And then on top of that, you guys, every church we've ever been to, because Dwayne was called to preach, he was called to minister, we had to tell everybody his background, his story, because we want to be transparent. And it was times in those seasons, during those times, there were some of the roughest times with Jawan that we had. I remember even going to church right down the road. By this time, God had put him in our house, and I'm raising him now. I just want to say this. If God can heal my heart, and these are not tears of pain, y'all, because I'm healed. I'm set free. I don't wake up with it on my mind. I don't, I, I, you know, I don't go to bed thinking about it. When I look at him, I don't see Juwan. Like, there's times when actually God has allowed me to forget he had a son. Because God can heal you to that degree. But it's just passion because I am touched with the feeling of your infirmities and your pain and what you're going through. I understand what it's like to be portrayed and hurt. But I also understand to get a whooping from God to say, you ain't all that, Miss Thing. <laughs> but I just want you all to know. It's nothing. Nothing too hard for God. When I say there is nothing, there is nothing too hard for him. It ain't nothing he can't fix and heal and redo over. Nothing. We are married now 32 years. I have a grandchild. But it's nothing. And I tell you, I have more respect for this man. I remember another time. It's so much to this that we don't even have time to tell you. But I just want to let you know one thing. I remember him coming to me. Because now you got to be open enough for this person to, to tell you their their the downfalls and what they're feeling and what they're going through. Because I'm going to tell you, the enemy still try you. But I remember he came to me one time and he said, I knew I was didn't want lust anymore. Because you know what lust does? It takes you, makes you have fun. You enjoy it. Then after a while, it takes over. When you don't want to do it, it's still calling you. So I remember him telling me, he said, I was driving from a woman's house on my way home. And he said, I felt like throwing up. He said, because I was determined. I'm going to go over here and see what she wants. I'm not having sex. And I'm done with this. This was before Christ. Because you can't. You can't deal with this monster in the flesh. You can't. There's no willpower. You, you, your willpower is not strong enough to defeat this. It takes the power of God. And so he said, and I felt like throwing up. He said, because I knew. I said to myself, I wasn't going to do it. He said, and I did it. He said, and when I came home, I felt so dirty riding home. He said, I was so sick. He said, that's when I knew it was bigger than me. Now it's bigger than I am. Now it's calling me. See, it'll let you think you're in control for a while. But then it'll take you over. It'll make you bow down when it ain't what you really want to do. Until you get God. Because he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And it's true. And when we, when he got born again and came back. Those same people in the church, we all got together. We went on a fast. We went on a three-day fast, absolute. He only drank water because he was still in the military. He had to train. On that third day, we came down off the fast, and Dwayne began to speak in tongues. And the deacon's wife said, did you hear him, Tawana? And I said, no. What did he say? She said, he'll never have another problem with lust again a day in his life. Until this day, it's been defeated. But I want to give hope to somebody today. Don't you give up on God.
You stay in the fight if it feels like you're dying. Stay in the fight. Don't give in. Get his word inside of you. Because I remember I had to quote scriptures to keep me from falling. I had to remember what his word says so that I can keep loving. So I went treat mistreat my husband after he got born again. I had to fall in love with his word in him. And I had to tell him, God, if you did nothing else, you've done enough. And I'm going to be with you. But I remember getting on my knees saying, I don't want him. Nope. God, I don't want this marriage. But when I read in his word how he looks at divorce and that he said, it's his will that we be reconciled. It's his first desire that we repent and love each other. I said, now I need you to help me. Y'all, I can go on and on. I'm going to turn this over. But I really feel in the spirit that somebody in here is hurting real bad. Real bad. When you think about your marriage, you want out. But you understand what God's word is and you need strength. I'm telling you, he'll give it to you. Just stay in it. God will save him. I promise you he will. Dwayne has so many women, he got to use your fingers and toes and mine too. But God can clean it up. He can clean it and make it like he was never with nobody but you. He can do it. He can do it. I love you. I never look at you wrong. I never um, judge you because I know what it's like to be in pain. I understand the hurt. Even if you were the one doing the cheating, he can clean you up. He can give you a different desire. He can. Even if you was the one that caused the divorce, God still can say, I can give you a new desire. I can help you. And if you're the one who was the recipient on the other end, he can heal your heart. You can look at him and say, I don't even remember you done that. You even, I forgot all about that. He can heal you like that where you can forget. And then he can make that baby. He can turn that baby's heart. And he can love you. Amen, so if anybody here today is, is feeling like you got any of that. I'm not shutting you up. Go here. I'm coming because I want to touch and agree that God's going to fix it, heal it, move it, set it free, do it again, make it new, whatever he needs to do. Don't be ashamed. Shame keeps you staying in the pain. Understand that God has been waiting a long time to set you free. He wants you to get that spirit of Jehu out of your marriage. And if you don't know what that is, that's that spirit that in front of people, he did everything right. But the scriptures say when he got by himself on his own, he still worshiped other gods. We want to get that mask off where you look good in front of people but behind closed doors y'all struggling we want to deal with that because that was us too we took some cute pictures but honey at home we was barely talking and don't you touch me talking about you want some sex you done lost your mind women we can't use that either I'm telling you, God want to do it today. If you have the courage just to get out of your seat and just move, just put one foot in front of the other, God will do it.